Welcome to the Johnny Dell Football Academy podcast on the channel that's trying to answer the whys and hows of the game by talking through and dissecting game film and diving deeper to explain why the X is zig and the O zag. I am Adam Marino, joined by Mr. Johnny Dell, and we are reminding you, as always, the most fun way to watch is on YouTube, where we go live. There you can comment into the live show. Be sure to hit the notification bell and turn on your notifications so you can be a part of the conversation. We also stream live on Facebook and X. Also, the audio versions are always found on Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your podcasts. Now, if you are live with us in the chat, it's probably because you are subscribed, you've hit the notification bell and turned those notifications on. So when sharing with your friends, be sure to let them know. We also love to hear from you outside of our live show. Email us at Johnny Dell's Football Academy at gmail.com. And you can always check out the website, jfa49.com, as it is the most fun way to support the channel. Also, the way we boost the chat and boost the algorithm is to type out hashtag JD49. Ah, uh, yes, JD Durham and uh, Marcos was the golden egg, right? Am I? I the golden right? egg award yes the gold it's it, yeah it's really the fried egg i so i started this thing it was on my review breakdowns the first comment would get the fried egg award much like the first person to wake up in the morning and get into the kitchen gets the fried egg uh, i was gonna do it as the golden egg you know because like the golden goose but i didn't have that emoji on my phone and uh and but i had a fried egg so it was the fried egg award and i've run with it and that's why it's the fried egg award i will say our new intro adam did a great job uh and his assistant uh making that happen putting that together for us um it gets me jazzed up every time i love our new intro i think it's it's awesome i'm ready to rock and roll every time so uh yeah i love it well i have two words for you you're welcome uh so let's get into all things niners there's we need some uh disclaimers we need some uh apologies but first before we get into that and the reason why is i i'm dying to just talk a little bit about brandon Ayuk and and jd says let's not whine for very long we will not have to get in but i did joke yeah and say well let's hope he doesn't unfollow i i literally said that like yeah in jest in jest at that and sure enough he's playing what all right <laughs> well yeah i mean look this is and going the exactly th yeah this is going exactly how we had talked about right we talked about this at the beginning and, and i said i did not expect any real movement on the brand and i front until after the draft I, I still believe that i still believe that that is what's going on and i think what you're seeing is the player starting to get frustrated that there's no movement. But this is exactly what I said the 49ers were going to do, was that there wasn't going to be any real movement. They probably came in with a low ball offer to start everything out right at the, at the end of the season, and Brandon Ayuk got upset, got, you know, well, I'm worth way more than that. And he starts the whole, you know, oh, I'm, I'm looking for a bigger payday than this. and Because it, it, it gets frustrating, and they're expecting a bigger, a much bigger number than the 49ers throw at them, and again, that's to start the negotiations, but the 49ers are not making any negotiations in earnest until after the draft. And Brandon Ayuk is sitting here waiting to get his biggest payday of his life. And he's wanting this secured. He's wanting this done. He's wanting everything. He wants the commitment from the team. He wants all of that. He's probably more impatient about this than all of us. And the 49ers are just not going to start negotiations in earnest until after the draft. They're they're not going to lock him in on a contract and reduce his trade value before the draft. That's not meaning they're looking to trade him. That's look that means if the Chargers call you with the number five overall pick because they need a, a wide receiver. I now that really is not going to happen. But if they did on the long shot that they did, you are not going to turn that down. 
You're just not going to. I love Brandon Ayuk. You're not going to do that. If you if a team gives you a mid-round pick, you're not going to turn that down. So they are waiting until after the draft. After the draft, negotiations will start in earnest. I do not foresee Brandon Ayuk being traded. Now, again, I, I've also said these things before and been way wrong. I said that we weren't going to trade Trey Lance, and we did. Uh, I said we weren't going to make a big uh, splash signing in free agency, and we signed Javon Hargrave. Uh, but th- this is very – it's playing out just like Debo did last year it's or two years ago. It's playing out like Nick Bosa did negotiations are not starting in earnest until after the draft. And yes, that does give a more condensed time frame. Uh, most people are saying, you know, why is this dragging on into training camp? You've had six months. No, really, they're operating on a three-month schedule, a really two-month schedule, more like six weeks is what they're really operating on for uh, negotiations on this. So, yeah, he unfollowed the team. Then there was rumors that he requested a trade. Remember, Debo requested a trade. That never happened. But... Uh, you know, there was rumors that he did that. Somebody cited a source within the 49ers building and then Brandon Ayuk's agent shut that down pretty quick. He retweeted that and just told the guy, you need better sources. And that was about as clear as it gets when that somebody has shut down that there's been a trade request. So Brandon Ayuk has not requested a trade. Uh, yes, he did unfollow the 49ers on Instagram. Like every receiver who's seeking a contract from their team has done over the past four years. That's your way uh, now of saying, I want you to speed this up. And the 49ers are not going to speed it up. They're just not going to. So you know, do I, do I expect fully expect Brandon Ayuk to be on this team for the next five years at minimum? Yes. Uh, do I think it's going to happen before June 1st? Absolutely not. So, um, you know, and again, we talked about this at the end of the season, Adam, right? And and we've talked about this since that I just did not see anything happening on the Brandon Ayuk front until well after the draft. They were going to wait until after the draft to start negotiations in earnest. And it's going to be a tricky negotiation. It will be. It, I fully expect this to go on into training camp because Brand, the the sticking point here is that Brandon Ayuk wants to be paid like an 18, 1900 yard receiver because he's on a team that throws the ball le- the least amount in the NFL. And so he's going to say, if I'm on the chargers, I'm going to be a 1900 yard receiver. Um, But I'm on the 49ers who run the ball more than anybody. They throw the ball less than anybody. So my 1400 yards is really a lot more, Uh, but they're going to want to pay him like a 1400 yard receiver. That's what they're going to say. And and that's going to be a tough negotiation, but do I foresee something happening? Absolutely. Yeah. It's kind of what we expected. And uh, we will keep our promise in that we will not whine about it very long. I I cringe when I see our haters, um, in in other forms, not not here, that call us the forty whiners. It just gets on my nerves. I don't know. So we're not gonna whine. There is about forty of us probably right now here. So we we are not gonna whine. We are just excited to talk more football. <laughs> um, and so that takes us to our reasoning behind a, a little disclaimer a little retraction a little uh mistake if you will and and i will yeah. start by saying that in in last no, <laughs> sorry to trigger you <laughs> no jd you are totally you no are trigger totally warnings good. here there's no yeah, trigger no, warnings good. on this channel bang bang we're fine um so no but i will say we talked about third round picks and today we're going to talk about fourth and fifth we're kind of going to jumble them together and so we're going to have some great some great ones for you but in the third round it hit me and it was so cool so me and johnny meet before the show for a few minutes at least usually right to kind of go over stuff and make it seem like we know what we're doing uh we fool you guys but so we i originally said like hey there's someone we definitely forgot and you pointed it out as well and so i'm gonna go ahead and apologize on my behalf of forgetting in the third round drafted that we missed was tom rathman i apologize to tom rathman he obviously watches every show i'm sure and so <laughs> i'm i'm sorry man <laughs> was and, and agreed right yeah. Yeah. It was one of those. I was, I was looking through the draft list again and I saw Tom Rathman in third round next to it. And I was like, Oh 
crap. We totally forgot Tom Rathman on there. And how do you forget Tom Rathman? Now, again, you forget that he was drafted in the third round, but I mean, we're talking like uh, a guy uh, who changed the fullback position. I mean, Kyle Juszczyk is today's Tom Rathman. And, uh, and so I was like, man, we forgot Tom Rathman. Like shame on shame, shame on us for forgetting Tom Rathman, who also was a 49ers running backs coach for years uh, oh, under Harbaugh. And so, man, like, and Harbaugh in, and uh, Jim Tom Sula and Chip Kelly. So, you know, uh, man, we forgot about Tom Rathman, and I am so sorry for forgetting that. That is that is almost a cardinal sin as a 49er to forget about the Tom Rathman. Now, there was another guy that we forgot about on the other side. There was, you know, draft. Uh, we were calling him like third round uh, disappointments, you know, because in the third round, it's hard to say necessarily that a guy's a bust because it's the third round. It's not a first or second round, but there's guys that had a lot of high expectations that came with them, even though they were drafted in the third round. We talked about a number of those guys and some of them were guys, you know, that started out really good uh, and, and everything. And I, again, I was like, how did we forget this shame on us, Adam? Shame. Shame. We forgot Gio Carmazzi. And we had talked about him. Like, I think it was on the first round show. Somebody put Gio in there. And I was like, no, he was drafted in the third round. I remembered it then, but I forgot on our actual third round pick. So uh, we, you know, we'll talk. Look, Gio, he was infamously drafted three rounds before Tom Brady. At the encouragement, at the behest, at the uh, desire of Bill Walsh, because Gio was known as a, a a raw prospect coming out with unreal physical abilities. I mean, uh, you if if you don't remember or remember what Gio looked like, go look up Gio Carmazzi. Uh, the dude was ripped. I mean, he was he was built. Um, you know, he kind of reminds you of like Taysom Hill a few years ago before he started really bulking up, but that kind of guy that was really physically gifted, that could run, that, that was, was very, uh, strong, had a big arm and everything, you know, and, and this is where I think as 49ers fans, we still have this great debate between physical traits and the intangibles and all the other stuff that goes along with, uh, with playing quarterback. And and I, I think that the Geo Tom Brady draft always comes up in that because what's been you know on uh, in in the 49ers sphere for the last 18 months about our quarterbacks it's been physical traits versus non physical traits that Brock Purdy does not have the physical traits in spades like some of the really high draft prospects. He's not quite the physical specimen that a Trevor Lawrence is, that Trey Lance has been, uh, but he's got the non-physical traits in, in absolute spades. But, you know, this is that great debate on that. Uh, Josh Allen has physical traits, you know, out in, in just in the stratosphere, and everybody wants that. Uh, and it's been this debate in the 49ers sphere of, of those two things. And we always come back to, yeah, but the 49ers went that down that road. And, and sometimes it's those scars that leave you of saying, look, you know, we went down that road with geo that bill Walsh was enamored by the physical traits there. And he went with geo while this guy from Michigan was sitting there named Tom Brady, uh, who went three rounds later to the new England Patriots and won seven Super Bowls and appeared in 10. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's hard to swallow, <laughs> but this was, I mean, the bill Walsh, the one who drafted Joe Montana, who made the trade for Steve young, but you know, geo, if you remember was drafted because as we had talked about in first round bus, that Jim drunken Miller didn't work out and he was supposed to be the heir apparent to Steve young that didn't, you know, Steve was was dealing with concussions and they weren't sure. He ended up playing a little bit longer. Jim, Jim Drunken Miller didn't work out. And then Steve did have the horrible concussion, courtesy of, Ane of Aeneas Williams. And so they went and drafted Gio. And St Steve Mariucci has talked about that they threw Gio out there way too early. That they threw him out, that it, really his career got derailed in preseason because he started getting hit real hard. Uh, he He didn't 
really know how to get the ball out of his hands and it rattled him right from the beginning. He lost all confidence and he said, you know, we look, uh, he was done at that point. Like there was, we just couldn't salvage him after that, uh, which is wild to think about. Um, but you know, then they started rolling with Jeff Garcia because Jeff Garcia, when they drafted Geo, Jeff Garcia was uh, was was seen as a stopgap. He was not the the franchise quarterback, and for a lot of the same reasons that have been brought up about Brock Purdy. But he ended up being a very very good quarterback and held the record for most passing yards in a season up until Brock Purdy broke it. Uh, still holds the franchise record for most touchdowns in a season and is the only quarterback, 49ers quarterback, to throw 32-plus touchdowns in a season in two consecutive years. Uh, so, but, yeah, so we we forgot Tom Rathbun and Gio Carmazzi. Man, how do we do that, Adam? So I, I'm not sure, and I will say I am nervous about <laughs> this show now that I'm like, I am triggered of... Uh oh! I hope we don't so uh, that we don't you know screw this up. So I'm I'm feeling um, confident here. I'm, I have a good list. I'm feeling confident. I'm 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 not confident in my my fifth pick here, but my my top four, I'm real confident in. So uh, I think what we'll do is we'll go five through yeah. two, and then we'll go to the honorable mentions. All right. So um, I Who I had trouble like five, you, Adam at number five. I have from 2004 a one Isaac Sapoaga. Isaac Sapoaga, huh? Sapoaga, yeah. Actually, I believe it was pronounced Sapoana. Uh, I believe that's how he he always everyone said it always was, said it wrong. Uh, yeah, I, I, I always like, said I always said it Sapoaga, but I I want to say uh, he said it was Sapoana. Um, something about that G in uh, well. All in, I know is he was in. born. I do know this. He was born at the wrong time because can if if we had this dude in some of our better team like years where our not only was our defense better, but it was just the offense was better because that defense held its own. I'm not saying the defense, but he yeah. just was on so many not very like they just didn't win a lot of games and. I can imagine him with, and I'm not being greedy saying like put him up with uh, Bosa and Warner and like whatever, but like uh, just if he was on a team that had a better offense or just freaking one more games, I think he would have excelled and would have gotten a lot more notoriety in my opinion, because as you know, the tape does not lie. And I think he was a beast. Yeah, so he was on my honorable mentions list, uh, Isaac Sapawaga. Um, but I, one of the one of my best memories of him. Now, he, I think you nailed it perfectly. He was a guy that was born at the wrong time because when he got drafted by the 49ers, they were terrible. He played one season with Harbaugh, and then they had to move on uh, from him. If you remember, he played nose tackle, and then I believe he went on to the Colts. Um, it was the Colts or the Eagles. I, I can't remember. Because uh, it was him and Abreu Franklin that, you know, Abreu was the nose tackle and then he moved on. Uh, and I want to say Abreu went to the Colts and then Sapawaga stepped in at nose tackle. He was the five technique before that. And and uh, Isaac stepped in and then he left in free agency the next year as well. Uh, but I remember I went to a game in Seattle. Uh, I believe it was 2008 and nine. Or 2010. It was it was in one of those years, and there, you know, every, the the guys always come out and do the pregame warmups. I remember seeing this one guy throwing the ball, no joke, 70 yards down the field, and I was like, "Where'd that ball come from?" And I looked down, and it was Sapawaga down. He was standing on the goal line, didn't even look like he was trying, and was chucking that ball, uh, just playing <laughs> catch. He was throwing it to the other 30 yard line. Dude had an arm. Um, uh, I mean. Well, like, good lord! Look at both his arms. Yeah. Well, a, yeah, I mean, but like, you don't expect a guy like that to just just fling the football like like you know yeah. one of the top quarterbacks in the league. Like, I was blown away. A uh, phenomenal athlete, phenomenal athlete. Uh, I think that was something that was really underrated because he was absolutely massive, about 320, 330 pounds, and could move laterally 
as well as some of the smaller defensive linemen and just strength out of this world. I remember, again, watching him in that game, and we we got blown out in that game, but he was not moved. I remember uh, seeing him just stand up and grab a guy, and it was one of the guards, and he bench-pressed him and threw him, like just threw him off the side. Um, I remember it did take him a number of years to really like for the light bulb to to go off and figure out how to play defensive line because he was so physically dominant that he would kind of get his way, uh, get get, you know, put him put himself in a bad position in as far as in the scheme. But I, I love I love the 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 idea there of uh, of Isaac Sapawaga. Uh, and and he, he was one of my favorite players during that time and one of the better players on a bad team. So, uh, yeah, uh, that's the way it was. I, I like the pick. Now, I'm going to go with another Polynesian guy, uh, but from a farther back era. So for me, at number five was Ricky Ellison. Uh, if, if, uh, if people under, remember who Ricky Ellison was, he was a teammate of Ronnie Lotz at USC and he was drafted by the 49ers in the third round. And he was drafted at the encouragement of Ronnie Lott to Bill Walsh. He said, this is a guy you want on your team. He's somebody who you need to bring in. He start, he, he, he was a seven year player with the 49ers. He lost two seasons to injury. So uh, his last season, he broke his arm, I believe, in preseason in training camp, and he missed the whole season. Then, but he he had played five of the six previous seasons as a full time starter. Was uh, made the All Rookie year his first year. The second year, he made the All Madden team, and uh, and during his five five starting seasons, the 49ers won three Super Bowls. And he was a big part of that and a big part of that defense. So uh, he's also part of the Polynesian Pro Football Hall of Fame and uh, and was drafted alongside of Roger Craig and our very own Jesse Sapolu. Uh, so what I have was Ricky that? Ellis in there. Uh, it was 1983. It was the 1983 draft uh, okay. was when Ricky Ellison was selected there out of USC. So he was my number five. And this one was so hard for me to put in at number five. I, I almost put somebody else and it wasn't Sapawaga. Uh, I was between this other guy. I'll, I'll bring talk about him more when we get to the honorable mentions. But uh, yeah, uh, that was my number five was Ricky Ellison. Uh, a special shout out to that 83 draft just because he'll never make mention in any of our shows at all. But his name is Mike Malarkey, and that's just a bunch of malarkey, and it's funny. You so. know, I almost wanted to put a guy on our on our uh, honorable mentions list. Um, I believe it was Mike Sandusky. Uh, just because, you know, Sandusky, Ohio, is home to the greatest um, auto point. part store in in history. Yeah, did but, you know that, Adam? Yes. That's the greatest Callahan. auto parts store. Callahan. Yep, that's right. Callahan, Callahan Auto Sports or Auto Parts in Sandusky, but also Ohio. In Sandusky is Cedar Point, where the world's best roller coasters. And I only live like less than three hours away. I've been there a multitude of times, and it is amazing. I have I, I will say I have coasters. been to Sandusky, Ohio, and there was no Callahan Auto Callahan Auto Parts. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you mean it was really just for the movie that seems odd uh, i know so, <laughs> i know tommy so, boy for everybody who didn't catch the reference tommy boy yes tommy somebody's Lighty. gonna go oh that's right that's they're about. they're now they're finally gonna get it um so okay i have for my uh number four yes cedar point is is the bomb uh number four i have is from the 86 draft Steve Wallace. Really? Okay. Okay. Defend Steve Wallace for me. So I just think he was a part of a lot of winning, you know, for me uh, on the line. And just for me, anyone that's a part of a starting squad for that time frame is going to be is going to be big for me and we'll find out in that 86 draft there's someone else who comes up pretty big who i think probably had some good battles in 
practice and rookie camp and things like that. Um, yeah. Um, but, I'm just, I'm just, okay. Look, uh, Steve Wallace is he, again, my honorable mentions list. Um, I'm just looking at who I have in the top four and I cannot wrap my mind around how you've bumped any of these guys off that list. Uh, so yeah, continue. Did we'll you see got anything more on Steve Wallace. Okay. So he was part of a winning team, uh, starter. I get that. I, I get that side of it. Um, for me, I liked all those linemen, ha Harrison. Yeah. I, I like, I liked all the, I just liked all those linemen. Like you, they were just uh, like okay. fun loving guy. Like they were like I, the I Washington Redskins. Like, you know what I mean? The hogs, they were like our hogs, you know, Yeah. to me. I, I, I think this next guy I'm going to talk about the, I don't, I think you left him off the list. And so, um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm gonna bring. So, okay. So for me at number four from Southern Methodist university was nose tackle, Michael Carter. Yeah. He's on my honorable mention. And I, and yeah. How did you put Michael Carter on the honorable mentions <sighs> list and, and, and have Steve Wallace. Okay. So Michael Carter, three time pro bowler, four time all pro. How yeah, you leave and, that and guy off the list? He got me a lot of sacks in in um, Tecmo Bowl too, and and he was a huge part of George Seifert being able to transition that defense from a four three to a three four. They could not have done that without Michael Carter, and he was an absolute. He was the immovable object at the at the middle of that line, and you know, pe again, people will always forget how good the 49ers defense was in the eighties uh, because their offense was so good and it was so revolutionary. But if you go back yeah. and look like what, what our defense was in 2011, 12 and 13, how good they were, they were right about on par with what, with kind of league rankings and what they were allowing to those eighties defenses of the 49ers. They were absolutely phenomenal, absolutely stout. And Michael Carter was a huge part of that. Again, the guy made four all pros, man. Um, uh, and it's, it's wild to look back then because right now it's, it's a lot easier for guys to get, you see guys who will have like eight pro bowls, one all pro, you know, sort of thing. Then you would see, there was a big difference between the voting and the AP because you'll have guys who are like two time pro bowl or five time all pro, you know, ex like explain that. Uh, but I mean, making four all pros is, is pretty incredible. Plus he was a, an, a, a U.S. Olympian. The dude was played, was a shot put guy and he won the silver medal in the Olympics. He's actually the only guy to win a silver, a, a medal in the Olympics and a super bowl in the same year. He did it in 88. Uh, so he was, he was, he was an Olympic medalist, silver medal in the shop, but Michael Carter there at nose tackle. So, uh, I was, and I, I said, I thought this was the guy you left off the list. Cause I'm looking at the top three and I'm like, there's no way Adam left any of these guys off the list. I think we're going to have a, it may be a slightly different order. Uh, we'll see, but yeah, so I had Michael Carter. If it, let, let, let me know if you remember Michael Carter in the, uh, in the chat there. Yeah, if you play Tech Mobile, then, you definitely remember him. Yeah, and then put hashtag Adam don't know. Oh, whatever. <laughs> don't put that. I mean, you can boost the algorithm, but <laughs> I mean, um, so at number well, now I'm nervous, but at, at number, number three. At number three, I have the the chicken dance, the neck. Um, number thirty six from the ninety one okay. draft, Merton Hanks. And okay. I was a huge more than the average like i started picking up on that dance before like i i just feel like i was in the top 10 percent of people picking up on that thing that he did before like before 90 percent of the fans did. you were I hip to it was before it was hip yeah i was just on it like i saw him do it and yeah, i was you like have telling to have, you have to have like, like a 10 inch long neck to be able to pull off the merton well, hanks i'm not saying i can pull it off but what i was saying is that i was telling people about it before it was like a okay. thing like i because i was just such a fan like i played um i played safety in high school um and just i i just 
I can't explain it. I just love Kali. He says, I almost broke my neck doing the funky chicken. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I think man. everybody, every 49ers fan at some point tried and then had to go see a chiropractor. Uh, yeah. Like, you know, oh. is so, some people are getting neck surgeries to, next week uh, because of their, of trying to in, imitate Merton Hanks. Um, now, that's also, I'll story. say, I'll say though, what he's done for the league since his retirement yeah. as well. It is to yeah. me enough to to put him so far as well because we look at what a draft pick is and then what he means to football and that kind of yeah. thing. So Merton Hanks uh, the night and draft. and most people don't don't remember if you saw our interview with Jesse Zapolo, you would know this story. If you didn't, um, go back check it out in the archives. That one of the my favorite Jesse Sapolo stories was everybody knows about the infamous Deion Sanders being late for curfew thing at the in the 94 Super Bowl and then uh him and Jerry Rice getting into it in a in a meeting the next day uh but Jesse told us <laughs> Dion was only like 15 minutes late for curfew and he was late because there's only one road in and out of the hotel he said we you know, we were staying at the Hilton and there was only one road is about a quarter mile long and it was jam packed with reporters and Dion had a charity football game that he was sponsoring earlier in the day and he was trying to make it back and he didn't he's like you know the next day i'm sitting there we're in a team meeting because i walk in and and uh he goes george was standing there and he looked miffed he goes because you could see something was off with george and we start the meeting and he goes and, and george is you know mf this mf that and he goes and that wasn't george george didn't talk like that we thought something was was off and he he calls out Dion, you know, for for saying that he was late and then walks out. And it's like me and the coaches, we're leaving. You guys need to handle this. And that's where the infamous Jerry and Dion thing came out. And he and he, Jesse said he talked to Merton Hanks afterwards. And he goes, man, that was wild. He goes, I ain't got room to talk. I, I missed curfew by about two hours last night. And he said Are you the same night. And he was like, what were you doing out past curfew? He goes. I couldn't leave. We were at the bar having drinks with Eddie. <laughs> with said, William Floyd. Floyd. With, with, with William a Floyd rookie. Was there too, a rookie. As a rookie. So, so Merton Hanks and William Floyd were hanging out at the bar having drinks with Eddie DeBartolo uh, before the 94 Super Bowl. And we're like two, three hours late for curfew. And this whole blow up happens the next day with Dion and Jerry because Dion was late by 15 minutes on a from a, a charity football game because he was stuck in traffic. Uh Merton Hanks, he, he goes, yeah, you, you just see Merton Hanks backing into the bushes during that meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was out with the owner. What can you do? So, yeah, Merton Hanks. So for me at number three, I also have out of the University of Iowa. Uh, so, you know, if, if most people forget that Merton Hanks was drafted out of the University of Iowa. So for me as well, University of Iowa, George Kittle. You thought I was going to say Merton Hanks, didn't you? Nope. No, I, for me, number three, George Kittle. I love George Kittle. I love George Kittle. George Kittle has missed some time. And, you know, unlike Merton Hanks has not come home with that Lombardi trophy yet. And, uh, so Merton Hanks is a little bit higher on my list. And, uh, but George Kittle, look, five time pro bowler, two time all pro has every major record for the 49ers for a tight end has multiple records for a tight end in the league. He was the fastest tight end to, uh, to 3000, basically 3000 yards receiving and still holds the record for most receiving yards in a half by a tight end missed the receiving yards in a game by like two yards in that same game, because he had 210 yards receiving in the first half against the Broncos. That was in 2018. Uh, just barely missed that record. Um, consummate pro is everything you think about as a 49er and what it means to be a 49er for this team. Uh, he's a guy that will put over his teammates every chance he gets. You know, he's a huge wrestling fan. And so if you if you're familiar with any of the terms of wrestling, you know, they always talk about uh, somebody's job is to put a guy over, meaning uh get a guy, you know, build him up and and build him up in the eyes of of the media and of the fans and really, you know, help get them over with the fans. And George Kittle, he follows that to the T. I mean, he's asked about any of his teammates. He's going to sit there and put that guy over all day long. So, uh, you know, famously had done that with, with Jimmy G for so long, had the Jimmy G t-shirts. 
and all that. Uh, but George Kittle, lo love George Kittle and everything he is. So he's number three on my list of best uh, third and fourth round picks there out of the University of Iowa. Uh, I think by the end of his career, he will probably end up number one on this list. Um, he's just got a little bit farther to go. I, and I don't know if he'll ever make number one based on my guy at number one. I will. I know add, who you have at number one. I don't I, have him at number one. I'm just going to tell you. I will add to George Kittle as he is my number two, so I don't have to say too much. But what well, I like about George Kittle is the fact that he was not, uh, because of his draft status, because of the guy that he was at Iowa, there is no way that when he met Claire, his now wife, who played basketball where Caitlin Clark played basketball, uh, there's no way that she thought, well, this guy's going to be a mega star. I better hang on to him. I just don't believe that. that no, especially a guy. guy who, well, yeah. his quarterback was C.J. Beathard, and he was only targeted 48 times, or 49 times, I believe, in college, like in four years. Yeah, I just don't. I mean, I just appreciate that relationship because out of all the relationships that between a tight end and his and his woman, I will say that I'll take woman. the Kittles because there's obviously when Taylor Swift met Travis, it was they were I, already I knew it. I was known. like, this is going into he's taking the Kittles over. Well, over, uh, the but let's look at it. Let's look at real love. Right. Let's look at. You, you know something about it with the lovely Dawn. And it's like, yes. wait a minute. Yes. Would you rather have someone who has known you when you truly were nothing and probably would have to get a job somewhere and be a working man? And all of a sudden, instead, you hit the jackpot and you marry someone who is a mega superstar. Then you didn't love him because of the superstar status is we my have gone off point. the rails here well th this was my number JFK two so podcast. i had to say something you already <laughs> said you already said that's my guy too so he's my number two yeah of, yeah so uh, I, say I will i, just, I will I say like i don't think I don't think T Swift is going to have to go try and get a job at McDonald's anytime soon. If, if things don't work out with Travis, I think no. she's doing pretty well. She uh, just, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> By a like mile. A, yeah. So anyway, <laughs> that's my number two. Who is your number two? Okay. So my number two out of James Madison university, five time pro bowler, two time all pro in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, the infamous, the controversial Charles Haley. So I have him at number two. Now, here is why I have him at number two. I know you have him at number one. I already know. I and I, I and look, if he had played, been able to uh, figure out some of the the mental things he was he was dealing with. Um, and had stayed with the 49ers for his entire career, for his career, I would have him unquestionably at number one. This is the 49ers. Now, not all time best fourth and fifth round picks. If, I, if I'm saying all time best fourth and fifth round picks, he's probably, you know, we did a top 10. He probably is in that top 10 because he was that great of a player. I mean, we we're talking about the Charles Haley who, uh, I mean, Look, defenses today, and and I'm gonna be I'm I'm trying to get the audio fixed. I I I told Adam I recorded three back to back to back uh, episodes for exclusive content episodes for my channel the other day. I've been I'd recorded the route tree video twice, and I didn't like how I did it both times. I was getting really frustrated. And I was like, I'm gonna do it a third time, and it's gonna be done. And I'm gonna just record three. Uh, videos back to back to back and I totally messed up on my side with the audio. The audio was absolute garbage and so I'm going to have to record it again which is really frustrating but uh, one of those videos is talking about what we call the Leo position which the Leo position was just an LLE word for left end um, that came that uh, Pete Carroll 
used in Seattle for all those years as the Leo that we use today still as a Leo position that Pete Carroll used, who he got that from George Seifert when he was our defensive coordinator in 1995 from an EL word, which was elephant, which was a call that George Seifert had in his 3-4 defense that meant that the pass rushing outside linebacker was not going to change if the strength of the formation changed. It was a call he had in there. So, for example, they usually rushed the guy away from the tight end. He was always going to be the outside linebacker in a base defense that rushed the passer. And then, but he, and so if a team started out with the tight end on the left side, then it was going to be the right side defensive or outside linebacker rushed. If they then motioned across and now the tight end moved from the left side to the right side, now it was going to be the left outside linebacker was going to rush. And so what teams would do is that they would come out and they would have a tight end on one side and they'd see Charles Haley would go to the other and then they'd motion the tight end across and Haley would have to drop into coverage. So what George Seifert did was he had a call that was called elephant. It's in his playbook and it's specified. I have his playbook uh, from that time and it specifies that that call means the, the pass rusher outside linebacker at the start, like at the start of the formation would stay as a pass rusher irrespective of the motion of the offense, meaning that even if they motion or ever, whatever, even if Charles Haley is on the side of the tight end, he's still going to rush the passer. And that turned into the elephant position. Then so uh, you may hear this talked about with Charles Haley being having played the elephant. Well, that was a call, meaning he was always going to rush the passer. And that's what allowed the him to then be able to move around because if he was outside linebacker and he was, it was an elephant call, he was always going to rush the passer. And so it became elephant call to elephant position that turns into Leo with jo- with Pete Carroll when he works under George Seifert and the Leo position is something that almost every team will run today. So Charles Haley was the one who really started that. And that was with George Seifert. So, you know, just a history of scheme there uh, of things from the X's and O's. We love that on this channel. Uh, and so, you know, Charles Haley absolutely changed the game. Now, for me, he's not on a 49ers number one because he won two Super Bowls with the 49ers. And there was a there's been a lot of infamous stories about him. It turns out he had undiagnosed bipolar disorder, and that was causing a lot of things, you know, obviously known for punching through one of the, you know, the the safety glass uh windows that had the, the wire mesh in there completely uh, messed up his hand. He had to have surgery about it, um, was known as, as doing some rather uh, mm, colorful things during team meetings and position group meetings and uh, had lots of run ins with George Seifert and George Seifert traded him to the Cowboys to the Cowboys because he just couldn't handle Charles Haley's you know mental side anymore. It was it was just so much he could not handle it. And then he goes and is a huge part of beating the 49ers and getting the Cowboys three Super Bowl wins. So I that's why I couldn't put him as number one, but probably the best player they ever drafted out of the fourth and fifth rounds. That that's why I have him ranked where he is. Uh so I but yeah, I don't have him as number one, but I understand why he would be. Um because he was just a, an unreal player. Yeah. And and that's simply why just I look at yeah, he didn't he won more Super Bowls um uh basically against us than he did with us. I, obviously he didn't play against us in the Super Bowl, but you know what I mean in the championship rounds. Um but yeah, but everybody I, I mean that those eras everybody knew whoever won the NFC championship game between was, the, the 49ers and Cowboys was going to win. Was the beating the Bills. Yeah, they were going to beat the Bills, whoever it was. <laughs> uh, I can't joke about the Bills, as sadly, there's been memes about us becoming the Bills, which I refuse to believe. But, yeah. No. Ugh, anyway, yeah, anyway. And, 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 it, and it, it may be the worst trade in franchise history, as Kali says you, know, uh, trading him to Dallas. I mean, it really did change. Yeah. Because, um, and, and the Dallas guys have talked about that, that, you know, Charles Haley coming over, he because yes, he had a, you know some mental health issues there. He was insanely smart, and uh, and they said that uh, I think it was Jimmy Johnson said that when he came over, that Charles Haley was able to sit down with them and tell them every last detail about every single player 
and their responsibilities and how they change and every because he had the entire playbook for everybody every position memorized and so he went over to dallas and was able to give them look if you motion this guy across this is exactly how it's going to change if you see this this in the back end and, i mean that is really not common for a pass rush specialist for a guy who's usually just rush the passer kind of a thing that he said it gave their offense such a massive advantage of the inside knowledge of George, the intimate knowledge of George Seifert's defense. So yeah, I mean, he, he's a guy that was, it, it, there's only two players in NFL history who've won five plus Super Bowls, and that's Charles Haley and Tom Brady. And he started uh, it. He was well, well before Tom Brady. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, like, he he was he was, he was the first guy to win five. Yeah, he was yeah. standing there alone at five Super Bowls for a long time. Again, it was it was a mental side. Now, you know, the 49ers did bring him back at the very end of his career. They were he had he had been out of football for two years, still came back and got some sacks, you know. Um, but Charles Haley and and if you play Madden again, Madden Ultimate Team, his card shows up every year and is absolutely dominant, uh, because yeah, it's just it's Charles Haley. So because he now was for me, dominant. <laughs> yeah. Now for me, at number one, we already talked about him a little bit out of the University of Iowa, Merton Hanks. So the reason I had Merton Hanks over Charles Haley is because when I think of 49ers legends and and iconic 49ers players, again, 49ers players, I have Merton Hanks a little bit higher up there. You know, the chicken dance that he and, and he was also a phenomenal player. You know, if Dion hadn't won defensive player, the uh, defensive MVP and defensive player of the year in 1994, Merton Hanks would 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 have been in conversation for that. Most people forgot. I think he had seven interceptions in 1994 um, that 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 Merton Hanks was a very, very good player. He was a five time all pro four time pro bowler. He was a very, very good player. Uh, and so, uh, you know, big part of of that. You know, early '90s '90s defense. Uh, he was drafted late in the '80s there, and and played a lot of seasons with the 49ers. And and again, when you think of you know iconic images of the 49ers, that chicken dance and Merton Hanks, and just also the production on the field. I mean, he was not a slouch. Uh, he was a very, very, very good player. So that's why I have Merton Hanks as number one. You have Charles Haley as number one. I. I can understand that. I had a hard time with that one. You know, it was, and again, it, the the tipping points were what they did for the 49ers. Yeah, I I love that because I really, I just love Merton Hanks that much. So for you to have him at one, I will never scoff at. Um, I'm excited actually to get into, I have a lot of guys here to go through and just kind of give some shout outs and just say that they came up and, the reason why they're not in the top five maybe some are obvious but um i'm excited to hear kind of some of yours um but i want to give um a, a couple here off off the bat i will it i will jokingly say mitch wishnowski <laughs> in 2019 i just think that he is an a well above average punter. the aussie bomber and yes being from australia Who is cool um, it's just who, uh, who moonlights is George Kittle, uh, according to John Chapman on his Twitter. Uh, that that's a little rib there for John Chapman. If you don't know last year, John Chapman was at the 49ers training camp and he saw, and th George Kittle was dealing, was coming off a back injury, right? Like he was, he was dealing with some stuff and, uh, and John snapped a picture of a player walking around and was like, George Kittle's out here on the field. He's coming out to practice today. And then George Kittle responded to him and said, hey, John, that's our punter, actually. Uh, <laughs> but the fact that Mish Wisnowski could be confused for George Kittle is something. It, it had to do with the long hair. But the build, I mean, Wisnowski, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't necessarily knock you for an honorable mention there. It's hard for me to have a punter there at that point and be like, yeah. Greatest yeah. fourth round pick ever. No, no, like, no. Or like, I, mean, I'm, I'm, I know, I know. But I'm just mean like one of the best fourth I mean, round he's picks. Not it's even, hard to have a punter in there. He's not even in top 15. He He's not. But I have a lot of guys. So, like, I just think it's funny. I love that he did the first punt instead of the first pitch for the for the Giants uh, this a couple weekends ago. Uh, it was just yeah. really cool. He punted the ball into where Barry Bonds used to hit the ball. <laughs> like, pretty you cool. Know, just booted now, in the I will, <laughs> I will say, I almost put a guy on my honorable mentions that he wasn't positionally a punter, 
but that was because back then they didn't draft just punters. So it was a, kid, a guy named Billy Atkins. Uh, he was drafted by the 49ers in 1958. Now his position listings are like free safety, defensive oh, back, yeah. right cornerback, like Pat free Summerall safety, strong. Played, like, yeah. Yeah. He, he played basically, he's just listed as a defensive back, but you look through his career and he played every single position of a defensive back and started a number of games as a defensive back, but was mainly known as a punter. He made all pro first team, all pro as for punting the ball and pro bowl <laughs> for punting the ball. But he was a defensive back. And st- I mean, imagine, imagine yeah. that Mooney Ward after, you know, defensive <laughs> stop runs out there <laughs> and punts yeah. the ball. That's what Billy Atkins was. And he was, he was a, a fourth round pick for the 49ers. So uh, I, I had him on now. I, I, I'm surprised you didn't put Bradley Pinion on there. Then if, if I know, uh, do you have, do you have Pinion on there? I, I looked at, I saw him, but no, I don't think he was as good to me. Okay. It okay. Is, you do have you can't just you can't just have a name. You have to actually <laughs> produce on you the You can't field. just have any punter. It's yeah. gotta be the Aussie bomber punter. Yeah. Now um I'm curious what do you think of a couple others um that were in the same frame of mind of like, hey, decent players, like I have memories of them making some great plays, and that is both Paris Harrelson and Lance Schulters. Both those guys okay. drafted eight years apart, I, but I yeah. think they were the, exactly the same type of player to me. In no, that, hey. no, 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 no. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll push back. So Paris Harrelson, um, I looked at it. I, I thought about for about four seconds of whether I was going to put him on honorable mentions, and I just, he didn't do enough. You know, there was a reason that, so now, again, so Schulters did more than your player. Yes, I think Schulters was a better player. Um, yeah, that's fair. And 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 in the league, so Paris Harrelson was. You know, if if people remember Paris Harrelson, uh, which you know, uh, sadly he's passed away. Uh, that was a number of years ago. Now he passed away, but um, he he was a good outside linebacker against the run. Was never the player against the pass, like as far as a pass rusher that right. ever really needed. And but if you do remember. Alden Smith's rookie year, most people forget that he was a pass rush specialist. So he was not a, a base down player that Paris, Paris Harrelson was that guy that he would play in the early downs, help defend the run. And then Alden Smith would come in and, and it was after Alden got a year under his belt and learned the scheme and learned how to defend the run that they let Paris Harrelson walk and Alden Smith stepped in, but his rookie year, he was splitting time. But, you know, he, again, he was a he was a, a decent player on a bad team for a long time. And uh, and I remember he was a very good edge setter uh, in that. But I, I just felt like he was just always kind of just a guy. Um, never, never much more than that. Lance Schulters, though, to me, he was if people remember it drafted in the late 90s, he was drafted to take over for Merton Hanks. Merton Hanks Hanks was out, was walking out the door with retirement. They needed to replace that all pro level of play from their safeties. And they drafted Lance Schulters. Now he just didn't, the problem was Lance Schulters was not, was not lost from the team because of performance. He was lost for the, from the team because of salary cap issues. They, you know, he was one of the cap casualties that, uh, that um, he had ended up being let go uh, I'm trying to remember who ended up taking his Tennessee. spot. It was Tony Parrish. It was and Tony Tennessee Parrish Titans took his spot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, he moved on. Lance Schulters went on to the Titans, and then Tony Parrish came in. Uh, but Lance Schulters was, was somebody who was very productive and a very good safety when he's with us. I felt like he could have walked to most teams in the league and been a starter. Paris Harrelson was not that kind of a player. Um, you know, if you look at, you know, top 15, 20 in the league at their position, Lance Schulters was Paris and Harrelson. That's was not. fair. So, and that's fair. I just didn't think Lance was like world beater good, but enough to like talk about. And I remember him making some plays and Paris Harrelson. I remember him making some plays. You mentioned against the run that he was above average. Well, Hey, if you're drafted this far and you're a name and you have, and you excel at something, it's worth a little bit discussing like, and again, yeah. another one like that for me, who who was above those guys is Deshaun Goldson. I think he was better yes. than Paris and oh, uh, and, I mean by a mile. 
and by well combined i think he was better than both Schul if you added up Schulters and harrelson together and made them one human uh deshaun goldson was still better than <laughs> yeah. than that like he was yeah, that deshaun good to me yeah and deshaun goldson was a phenomenal player uh and uh i mean some of his highlights are still, we still put him out there. I will always remember the hit he put on. Hit, oh I'm trying to remember God. who it was. Number 83 from the Cardinals. He came Ugh. down and double nike the guy. I uh, was known as one of the hardest hitters in the league. Now, it, it, again, if you remember, he was drafted at the time. The 49ers had a starting safety that they liked. I didn't like. I thought he was slow as molasses on a cold winter day. That was Mark Roman. Um, <laughs> and, 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 uh, and they, they, had drafted Deshaun Goldson and he started splitting time almost immediately with Mark Roman and he had to learn the game. Uh, he came in and yeah. once he did though, he was lights out uh, playmaker ball hawking safety could just hit everything that moved. Uh, Deshaun Goldson was one of my favorite players. Another guy who again was not with the 49ers, not because of ability, but because he moved on because of cap situations. He was a cap casualty. The 49ers were up against the salary cap there in 2012. They let him go. And infamously the Tampa Bay Buccaneers flew out uh, a private jet and, and brought him out there to court him to, uh, to come over in free agency. Um, so Deshaun Goldson, uh, you know, he, all pro player. He was actually the guy that I was, I was, I was back and forth between Ricky Ellison and Deshaun Goldson. And yeah. the, the tipping point for me was that Ellison played longer uh, with the 49ers. Deshaun Gold and Deshaun Goldson did miss one season with injury and yeah, you know, had some issues fair. there, but you know, like, Deshaun Goldson had two years with the 49ers that were some of the best years as, as far as safety play. Uh, you know, his 2000, I believe it was 2010 season or nine season, I, I think 2009 or 2010, when he really exploded onto the scene was just as good as Hafunga's season last year. And, uh, and, and then, you know, obviously was part of a team that went to the Super Bowl or, or excuse me, uh, went to the NFC championship game. Then again, he, he left, uh, but was a very good safety for Tampa Bay for a number of years there with them. Uh, loved Deshaun Goldson. He was part of my honorable mentions as well. Uh, yeah. I'm, I, can I drop an honorable mention? Yeah, let's do it. So here's a guy. And God, ever since that <laughs> comment on the show, every time I say that, here's a guy. Dr. Steve. Uh, Dr. Steve, his comment comes back to haunt me. But Brandon Lloyd. Brandon Lloyd, wide receiver. People remember him. Again, a, a really good player on a really yeah. bad offense. Had Brandon hands. Lloyd, man, you talk about a highlight machine as far as catch. Yeah. Like he was Odell as far as the, the highlight catches before Odell. The one-handed grabs and the catches that guy would make were just unreal. Now, he was also a very um, confident young man, I remember. As most uh, wide receivers are. Yeah, I, well, I remember there was there was some some friction between him and some veterans on the team that was uh, in the in the news at the time, the and and he was you know on a team that did not have any sort of stability at quarterback uh, ability to to get the ball on target. That was one reason why he had so many amazing one handed catches, uh, and but phenomenal. Receiver, I, th I think he's one of the most underrated receivers that has been out there because when he went to s some other place, he was a thousand yard receiver and and again, highlight machine. We did bring him in for a little while there uh, near the end of his career, and he was still able like some. I remember him making a couple one handed catches that were just unreal. Uh, so when you say like, I mean, ability to catch the ball one hand like hands as a receiver, just phenomenal. I will always remember. I think it was his rookie year. I remember he was running a fade route down the sideline and it was thrown up and him leaping out and just reaching out fingertip, one handed catch diving and bringing it in. Uh, I mean, just such a fun guy could jump out of the gym, uh, insane vertical, but uh, it, just a, a player that I, I, again, you put him on a team with a good quarterback at that time and, and Frank Gore and all that, that offense could have been so much more. It yeah. could have been so much more. And that 2006 year, we saw glimpses of what it could be. But again, 
you know, at that time, the 49ers were dealing with a lot of issues and, and he was, you know, finding his way and all that stuff. So uh, Brandon Lloyd ended up being on my honorable mentions list. Another thing that should be on everyone's honorable mention list is our website. So remember to take a peek at uh, JFA49.com has all kinds of stuff on there. It will have um, just content that that you are on and, and, this and, channel for. The wise yeah, and, and like out. I talked about, I'm I'm really working on it. I promise. I'm I'm not uh, letting it go. I've I've run into some te technical difficulties. It mainly because like to do some of the content that I'm doing there is a completely different format, and so I'm some of it's me having some growing pains and learning pains through how to do some of this stuff in a different way, uh, but we'll provide something different than what maybe some other people are doing and what we do on everything that you see here, but goes a little bit deeper. Uh, and so you know it we we are working on it really hard um and and with it uh and so but a huge 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 thank you to all of our uh coaching staff there at jfa49.com if you don't know you can go there and and become a supporter of direct supporter of this channel and uh and become an assistant coach we have the uh the quality control coach tier we have a position coach tier and we have a an offensive or we have a, a coordinator tier uh so you can become part of our coaching staff here uh that's what we call our direct supporters they have been so huge in helping continue this channel through the off season and really it's it's that that year-round support really really helps for everything we do in season uh of, of getting the the software and the the materials that we need to put out all that content we do during the season uh is a huge help uh, that way i'm not having to cancel anything or change things in the off season when you know the the the, the revenue off the ad the ads and everything starts to drop off um so huge thank you to our coaching staff they have been uh big time uh supporters there and and really are the heartbeat of this channel and just like uh just like the coaching staff for the 49ers is is you know makes or breaks the team it's not all about kyle shanahan uh this channel is not all about me it's not all about adam it's about our our coaching staff that helps us really uh keep things going and keeps pumping out that great content big time yep so remember to share the channel with a friend again the best advice i can give is when you see someone wearing niner gear go over to them show them your phone get on youtube show the channel maybe point out one of your favorite videos mine is uh the one on brock purdy for mvp just how i like that video in particular if you haven't seen it because he opens with johnny opens with him being sacked and like some negative plays and then explains why those are in there and just breaks down everything again this channel breaks down the whys and hows of the game and watching film and being able to dissect those and see why again we just say the x is zig and the o zag but why why that is and so very cool so show people that channel show people the podcast you can show them uh Je that we interviewed jesse sapolu again one of our favorite ones which he will come up probably in a next episode which i can tell you about uh looks like probably friday we'll get into just late round picks right as a whole yeah right of yeah. people i mean jesse was a really late round pick really late to, round pick and we have to honor him for sure so and and a multitude of other people as well so that'll be fun uh that'll be a lot easier to leave people off a list geez because now we're just highlighting like at this point just all of those rounds so we're really gonna have to dive deep so i'm gonna have to on a lunch break maybe just peruse around <laughs> and look a little bit right yeah <laughs> so that'll be all fun right, how, let me ask you how many more honorable mentions do you have i have two i i have just have left i i have mine were um it too soon is huff and greenlaw like i kind of okay. want to so you did I have huff on there yeah i mean he you know made the pro bowl and has done some really awesome things and it's just not at a point yet where we can say much about it because it's not enough time and with time missed now um he redshirted, of course, as is tradition. But like, so for me, it's like, and same thing with Greenlaw with missing time, but being a key impact player for us, and like, so it's just not, it's, it's just not enough yet, you know. Obviously, yeah. Well, I mean, like, I, I was a little surprised you even have Huff as an honorable mention. 
Um, and, and that's not me citing how I didn't have Hafunga on my honorable mentions list. Uh, and, and again, it's the same, it's for exactly what you said. It's just, he's only been in the league three years right? and he's had one really good year. Yeah. That's fantastic. Uh, but, and, and he had a, a pretty good start to last year. It was probably headed towards the pro bowl. Probably. Right. But, Trajection you know, is hard, what we're going to say. Off of. Yeah. If he comes back healthy. You know, yeah, I, I think I think another solid season from Hafunga, and he would at least be on my honorable mentions list. I don't have him yeah. there yet. I don't have him there yet. Uh, again, just you know, one really impactful season wasn't enough for me. Now I did have Dre Greenlaw on there uh, because you know, and and sometimes it's the iconic plays and moments like 2019 against Seattle, that stop at the goal line at the end of the game uh, that helped. And that was his rookie you know, year, wasn't it? That was his rookie year, dude. That's so you know Greenlaw has been with the play, team yeah. for a while. I love Dre. I think he's you know and and losing him and he's also something again. Losing him really highlighted how important he is to the team because that defense did not look the same the moment Everyone's he went down in the it. Super Bowl. And non 49 er fans are submitting that. Like, yeah. Oh man. Yeah. yeah they're yeah, like they you know him. that was a that was a big change in that game so for Dre Greenlaw was absolutely on my honorable mentions again he was another guy that I it was really Dre Greenlaw Deshaun Goldson uh Ricky Ellison were that were right there at that number fifth spot I, I would I would say Ricky Ellison Dre Greenlaw very very you know similar as far as you know players and and same position as far as you know impact on their teams and that kind of a thing and and it was just Ricky Ellison again because he had more years starting and won those three Super Bowls. Now again, I know he's not the guy who won those Super Bowls, but you know Dre Greenlaw, that was tough. That was really tough to yeah. on those guys. So so those were, it. you know, I, I totally understand with Dre Greenlaw. Now I have a guy that you don't have on there uh, as far as an honorable mention and that's Len Road. Uh he was a tackle that was drafted by the 49ers in a, in the late 60s and he was a, a starting tackle for the 49ers for 12 seasons. Uh, he was a fourth round pick. I mean, you get a tackle in the fourth round who starts for you for 12 years. And he was a, a one time uh, pro bowler and one time all pro. And uh, and during his time there with the 49ers, they led the league in passing yards twice. They led the league in yards gained two or three times. Um, you know, they had some good offenses there that he was a, a big part of. And he was the left tackle. I mean, he was protect. Pre protecting the quarterback's blind side that whole time for 12 years. Again, that the seventies era is a time that we really, you know, gets lost in the shuffle a lot there because the team was so overshadowed by the team of the eighties. And the, you know, there was some, there was so much turmoil, especially at the end of the seventies, uh, uh, when the team was sold from the Marabitos to the Bartolos and, uh, and all that, um, that, uh, you know, we, we forget about those 70s teams, but Len Road was was somebody who uh, was a very, very good player uh, for a long time for the team. So, you know, we talk about Paris, Har Paris Harrelson being a starter on the team for a long time. Uh, Len Road was was a starter and, and played at a high level for an at a, at an at a more important position for a really long time. And so he was on my honorable mentions. It was another person that was kind of tough you know where do you, does does he slide into that fifth spot is he only off of the top five because he played during the 70s and so uh but but a very long career with the 49ers and a very good player so uh len road was was there and, and also apparently the owner of uh multiple burger kings and applebee's so uh, good for him he, he did Attaboy. well for himself after football um yeah. but that's been our our top five Fourth and fifth round picks of all time. More, you know, there was more good players out of there than you would think. Uh, now, again, we're going way back into the even the 60s. So, we're you know, 60 years of drafts, you should have some right. guys in there. But I think, uh, you know, by the time it's all said and done, the 49ers will have two Hall of Famers that come out of the out of those rounds uh, with Charles Haley already in the Hall of Fame. And I think George Kittle's headed there. I think. Oh, yeah. You know, by the time his career's done, it'd it'll be really hard to keep him off that list. You have a bunch of bunch of uh Super Bowl champions there and you have some really, really good players. So uh, you know, and, and what you notice is uh, for me, I saw more of the the 
you know, top end starters of the fourth and fifth round from the eighties. And then, you know, that same sort of period when the 49ers during the Harbaugh era were able to go on their runs. And then now of what we see from, from the team now, as far as you know, good players, because there's a bunch of good players that again, are on that fringe, you know, Diamador Lenore, he was a fifth round yep. pick. Ambry Thomas and is on there. A- a- Ambry, uh, Th- and I, Ambry Thomas, you know, he's, he's been okay. Um, right. You know, but, but, but I you saw those some, guys, some too. players, you know, uh, that were are, are, are players that have been productive. And and you see when the teams hit really in those mid rounds and they have really good starters, there, that is such a big part of a team making a run. And when you're able to get high production from not your first and second rounders. Right. So, even that they I think that's the been the, and, yeah. yeah, I mean, because because I look at this and go, you know, yeah, it's it's easy to look back at the team in the 80s and say, you know, it was all about those first and second round picks and they had Ronnie Lott. And but then you start looking at, you no, know, those teams were really built in third, fourth and fifth rounders. You know, yeah, they had some offensive linemen. They had Ronnie Lott, you know, obviously in the first round. But you look at like Roger Craig was in the third round. You had Tom Rathman in the third round. You had Jesse Zapolo in the 12th round. You had Joe Montana in the third round. You had Charles Haley. You had right. Michael Carter. You had Ricky Ellison. You have all these guys who were starters and good stars. You had Randy Cross in the third round. And we had talked about him in, in the last episode. Yeah. Uh, that you have a lot of good players that have come out that that were starters that were built on those teams in those mid mid and later round Romanowski. portions of the draft. Yeah. Yeah. Bill Romanowski. We talked about him, you know, so I think that's been the, the biggest illumination for me is, is kind of, and what's been fun of going through this list. And then when you also look at like periods of really dark times at the 49ers, the amount of misses in the high rounds is just <sighs> staggering. Yeah. You know, that's, what's been so fun. And I guess, you know, learning for me is really looking through e- the, the draft years and the rounds and saying, okay, you can, you can identify, you know, the championship teams because you start looking through those drafts and they're nailing all those draft picks and they're nailing those mid round picks and they're getting these guys. And you look at the 49ers, you know, that 2017 and 18 draft of nailing those mid round picks and getting some, some players there that have been so, so key to the success of the team. And, you know, what's been weird about the 49ers as as this iteration is that they've missed on so many early round picks, but then they've nailed so many old, later round picks, you know, like Drake Greenlaw, like George Kittle, like Mitch Wisnowski. Let's put it. Let's put him on there. <laughs> there. Like Talanoa Hafunga, right? Uh, like Aaron Banks, who, you know, he's he's been a part of that. And then some of the drafts picks that they've been able to get give away and get quality players for like when they traded for Trent Williams hitting on Brock Purdy in the seventh round, you know, those, those positions and those players, it, you see, you know, these are, these are big parts of that Fred Warner in the third round, you know, that, that there's so much that goes into hitting on these guys in the mid rounds uh, that they've been, they've been that, that like, like is kind of in between place, you know, between, the, and and that and that's one of the reasons they've had a little hard time getting over the hump is that you 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 look at the Shanahan drafts and you say you know there's no one draft I go they just nailed this draft but there's also no one draft you look at and go man they really botched that draft uh, <laughs> that they've been able to pull players out of it. that's what's been fascinating about about this era is you look at Bill Walsh's era they had a few drafts in there they absolutely nailed uh then you look at some of the down years and you go there are some drafts they absolutely botched um and and then the, you saw the downstream effects of that but this that's what's been fun about this for me uh I'm, I'm excited to wrap it up on friday you know we are getting real close to the draft now and we're gonna uh, hopefully next week bring bring some people on that have been really diving into the draft we haven't done a mock draft on this yet because again that's like everybody's doing and it just I, I start feeling like it's oversaturation uh that everybody's doing mock drafts and everybody's doing these sorts of things and i, I was like this close to doing it and i was like eh, i feel like just the, like every channel i was turning on was like mock draft mock draft mock draft and i'm like is mine really going to be the, the the difference on that uh i've really enjoyed uh going through the history of the 49ers draft and and kind of you know talking about these players that, that you don't always remember like the deshaun goltz and like a paris harrison like a lance shoulders lance shoulders one of my favorite players in the early 2000s so yeah no question um another name as we wrap up i will give you that was drafted um in these later rounds is 
uh, Iweza <laughs> the receiver, who made some pretty big catches and made not only made the team, but did some things and not enough to really, you know, get talked about that much. But again, that's why it's fun to go through this because you're like, oh, yeah, I remember Iweza K. And I remember like, seeing the name and like what and then like he made some plays and like okay like again not enough to like really be worthy of much but just to go through because it takes you back to not only that player but then that that time frame and then other players that you do remember jeff garcia and just his whole story and just other things yeah. like that where it's like man that's fun to go through that so yeah this has been fun uh, make sure if you have not caught, if you're watching us live and you haven't caught the other, the other shows regarding our, uh, talking about these draft picks, go back and, and check them out, share with Niner fans and turn on your notifications. Make sure that you get notified so that, you know, when we go live on YouTube and Facebook and the Twitter, the X, whatever you want to call it, all that good stuff. So we will catch you Friday, but in the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, and as always, go Niners.